All right, everybody, if you're still there, we are live again now. And we had a little bit of a technology issue. I think we got that worked out. Jacob, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. You know, it just occurred to me. Jacob, say something. Can you hear me now? Yep. One more time here. I'm going to mute this one volume. I think I had you on a different volume source that didn't make sense to me. So, how about now? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Perfect. Okay. All right. One more minor change. Okay. I'm getting closer, Jacob. Okay. This is weird, but it's working. Is the audience able to? Uh, watch along live and ask questions or yes okay they will ask questions by the uh, chat box in YouTube in YouTube okay um, is there a way for me to see that unfortunately no we'll just... okay that's okay yeah if you just stop me as the deal goes through yeah I'd be help. happy to answer whatever I can All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, it's nice to meet you guys. I'm sorry that this is virtual. I had every intention to be there at the actual um, office today. Um, unfortunately, last Thursday, I was diagnosed with COVID, and so I have been at home quarantining myself and um, been held up here. So luckily, I've been feeling all right. Um, for those of you that don't know me or have not met me or that I haven't had the opportunity to meet in person, um, my name is Jacob Edge. I am actually a uh, physician at um, Freeman Hospital in Joplin. I'm one of the hospitalist physicians now. I was uh, originally from Diamond, Missouri, went through K through 12th grade there, and then went on to Missouri Southern where I did MSSU and also Crowder College in conjunction with each other and got my EMT basic. I worked for Newton County for a couple of years as just PRN um, EMT basic, and then went on to um, work at St. John's as a tech in the ER. And then after school, I went on for my master's degree in biomedical sciences, and then my um, medical school at KCU in Kansas City. Um, both of myself and my wife are physicians now. Um, Shelby is a internal medicine physician as well at Freeman Hospital and she of course is Rusty's uh, um, youngest daughter. So um, to talk about today, uh, the big topic was toxicology. Um, we have an hour to kind of go over um, this topic. Obviously I know we're getting a little started a little bit late um, but I did try and condense a lot of this topic because there's such a broad spectrum of topics to go over in toxicology. When we talk about toxicology itself, it goes into alcohol use, substance abuse disorders, it goes into organophosphates, insecticides, all kinds of household exposures, and anything and everything you can think of. I have to apologize, I don't have as much information um, on children as I do as an adult, um, because I primarily focus um, my practice on internal medicine, so anyone 18 years of age or older. Um, if you do have questions that are child specific or anything like that, we can definitely try and uh, look them up together, or I can definitely try and get you the answers that you want. Um, so to start off today, we're going to um, go over the topic of toxicology. My big talking points for today are terminology that we use um, today specifically and then also resources for overdoses and exposures to toxic substances. Um, when we talk about resources, I'm talking about your medical control, your poison control, all these different deals that we'll kind of go over on contact information, who to contact and when to contact. We're going to go over assessment and evaluation topics, just kind of reminders because this is a refresher course to kind of be vigilant about looking at the patient themselves, things to look at for assessment and things to go over that are specific for some of these um, major um, substances. 
We'll go over major toxidromes, and I'll explain what toxidromes are moving forward. And then we'll go over the big illicit drugs that we see a lot in this area and a lot of the overdoses we tend to uh, go over. We'll talk about alcohol um, overdose and then alcohol intoxication and alcohol withdrawal. And then we'll go over some of the big over-the-counter medications and prescription medications, those being psych medications and then Tylenol. So to start off with, for our terminology, in talking about toxicology, we're talking about the study of toxic or poisonous substances. Toxicology encompasses a number of both prescription medications as well as um, even hazardous materials that we find around the home, such as cleaners, um, insecticides, pesticides, even other toxic substances such as toxic plants that people can ingest. Well, we won't focus a lot on the plants and more make more of our focus on prescription medications today. Um, those are other things to be talking about in toxicology and other things to be aware of that you can call poison control on. Um, when we talk about pharmacokinetics today, obviously we're talking about the activity of the drugs in the body over time, including the processes of absorption, distribution, and elimination of the drug within the body. It's not just the drugs too, as well as the substances. So um, we also talk about bioavailability, which is the percentage of unchanged substance within our systemic circulation. So when we ingest a substance, how much of that substance is left after metabolism occurs in the liver or in the um, renal system or other systems that break down and metabolize these substances. And then we talk about half-life, this is the time um, for an average person um, like you and I to metabolize or eliminate 50% of the substance within their plasma um, and to start seeing some of the effects wear off. While we won't go over a ton of the half-life or bioavailability, some of the phar pharmacokinetics and pathophysiology will be discussed um, today. So like I was talking about, we're before resources for especially any sort of emergency personnel are always going to be medical control for you guys knowing whether it's Freeman or St. John's within the Newton County system or within your own system. Um, medical control is going to want to be notified immediately of any type of ingestion. Uh, the sooner that they have an idea of what this person has ingested, the sooner they themselves can either get on the phone with poison control or direct you to poison control. We want to know of any type of risk for contamination depending on materials ingested or depending on a potential for exposure, especially in organophosphates and um, insecticides and stuff like that that are the organophosphates. They are going to want to know that way ahead of time so that they can have the contamination pro decontamination process in place there at their facility prior to your arrival. Um, poison controls number, especially here at Freeman, the number that we use is 1-800-392-9111. Um, this number is a great resource both for the hospital and pre-hospital staff. Um, it's quick and easy to use. They have a 24-7 um, um, staff member on call, usually a RN that specializes in um, understanding these substances and knowing where to look for um, information and to be able to send you information, uh, whether that be over the phone or whether that fax that to um, the facility. Um, they can look up signs and symptoms that you should be monitoring in the field on transfer to the facility and also the toxic potential of the agent so they can warn you ahead of time whether or not this drug versus substance is going to cause significant harm to the patient in that time frame that you are transferring them from the scene to the facility. Other big apps, especially apps that are used within the hospital or on a clinical setting, Hippocrates does have a pill finder app. Um, these days, a lot of the toxicology we tend to talk about are overdoses on even prescription medications. Uh, Hippocrates will actually um, provide you with pictures and pill IDs that you can look to look up what a pill looks like, um, what its characteristics are, 
and can maybe help an individual identify whether your patient took that particular medication or even help the patient identify the medications that they took. So to begin the assessment of these particular individuals, we wanna start that prior to arrival. Clues for our patients come in when we are getting dispatched out to the actual scene or to the patients themselves. When we talk about dispatch giving us information, they initially generally identify the age of the individual, whether they're at home, where they are particularly, whether that's on the ground, how they're acting, whether they are lethargic or not responding. Um, they also help us out with scene safety on whether or not this was an intentional or accidental overdose and whether this person is combative versus, you know, um, lethargic. Uh, in combative individuals, obviously, they are helping to um, notify police and other fire entities to get out to help you guys um, secure the patient and um, make sure that you guys are staying safe as the paramedic and the medical officer on scene. So <clears throat> the initial assessment also begins with scene survey once you arrive. Um, obviously, when we talk about uh, talking with these individuals, scene survey begins as you're walking up to the patient. You know. When we're looking at the patient themselves, what things are around them? Do we see multiple pill bottles around them? Are those pill bottles um, open or are they empty? You know, what are the characteristics of the pills around us? Um, then are there household cleaners, handwritten notes, other types of drug paraphernalia around? Does the individual have signs and symptoms that they're you know, an IV drug abuser? Do they have track marks at their arms? Are there fingernails worn and dirty or extra long, you know, anything and everything can be a clue for you walking up to this patient on whether or not, um, you know, they're a chronic uh, substance abuse user or whether or not this is some other type of overdose or potential exposure. You know, are they a young child that was able to get into contact with cleaners underneath the counter? or um, they're in the garage, what is around um, the particular patient when you're walking up on them. A lot of the focus today, of course, is gonna be on the prescription medications. Um, so that's kind of why I talked about for prescription meds specifically, we wanna see what the pill bottles are. If we can bring those into the hospital, um, it can one help uh, pharmacy techs within the hospital identify whether this pill was recently um, filled or how many refills they had on it. Is this a, you know, a back end refill that they've had multiple refills on within a time frame that was not appropriate for what was given to them by their provider? This can also help us to see how many they've taken. You know, each pill bottle provides us with a prescription pill count. And so we should be able to count those pills to know has this individual ingested 50? Have they ingested 20? You know, that's one of our biggest things. We also want to know when the prescription was filled, how old the prescription was, whether this was something old that they had in their cabinet and decided, hey, I'm going to try an overdose or trying to uh, commit suicide or do something with. And then are there any other medications near them? You know, most of the individuals that use prescription medications that are intentional overdoses, they tend to take more than just one medication at a time and knowing what the other medications are that they took can be very useful for both you guys and the facility that they're going to. Um, when we're able to identify other medications that they've taken in conjunction, it can tell us whether or not the other medication is going to affect, affect the metabolism of the um, medication we're specifically worried about. So talking about our primary assessment, what is obviously the mechanism of injury or the nature of the injury that we're talking about. We want to determine severity and set priorities early on. So is the patient alert and oriented? Are they up talking with me? Whenever I walk into the room with this patient and I ask them, sir, how are you feeling? Are they moaning and groaning and not able to complete full sentences? Or are they completing full sentences but look somewhat lethargic? Or they are, are they completely alert and oriented? Or are they going out of their mind and hypervigilant and 
ready to jump off the wall. Um, next thing, of course, is are they protecting their airway? If an individual is able to talk to me, have a conversation, able to cough, I'm a little less worried about whether or not they're protecting their airway. But if they're laying on the ground lethargic, not able to answer in full sentences, that's when the big, big concern comes of whether or not um, they have a protected airway or whether or not they're at risk for aspiration or um, any other um, respiratory depression. Um, throughout the assessment too, as I'm asking my questions, is their speech changing? Am I noticing slurred speech? Am I noticing some sort of abnormality with the physical exam? Like, are they becoming more lethargic? Do I have trouble trying to keep them awake, trying to um, answer questions? Things like these are huge clues into, is this getting worse for them? And are they themselves worsening? So history of taking, of course, we go back to, you know, the basics of OPQRST and sample questions. Um, whenever I was going through EMT school, and especially whenever I was going through medical school, OPQRST was what I used, onset, provocation, quality, rating, severity, and time. All of those answer questions, and even for these individuals, when did they take the medication? What provoked them to take the medication? You know, how are they feeling now that they did take it? You know, what are the quality of their symptoms? Um, while many of them don't have any sort of pain, so rating kind of gets thrown out of the window, is there associated symptoms or other symptoms um, coming along with them ingesting the material they did or the medication that they did? So uh, to choose the appropriate course of action, we have to answer the following. What is the substance? Is this a prescription medication? that they had at home that they accidentally, you know, took too many of, or is this a medication that they intended to take, or is this a cleaner that the child has gotten into, or is this some sort of exposure to insecticide or pesticide that they've gotten through having the material spilled on them. Um, we want to take them to, or things that we want to bring to the emergency departments are any of the pill bottles, containers, or remaining contents that are left. Part of this is so we have an idea of the substance and we can provide better data to poison control when we ourselves call. Because besides you calling on the way to the hospital, the hospital themselves is going to attempt to get into contact with poison control and they will stay in contact with them throughout the entire stay of the patient on uh, most instances. And poison control puts them on a list where they call back and talk um, to the provider to see how they're doing or to the nurse to see um, the particular um, managements we've put into place. How is that affecting the individual? Um, we want a safety data sheet if possible. Um, obviously, especially those exposures and um, industrial settings, a lot of times they are going to have um, forms and biohazard sheets and everything worked out for every chemical that they have there at their facility. And so a lot of times you can request that from the facility before you even make it on scene. Um, we want a copy of uh, copy or photo of the drug label if you can't bring the actual container. And then if it's some sort of abnormal plant, we want a sample of any ingested plants. You know, if they've said that they've eaten some sort of fungus, you know, can the um, law enforcement agent or someone else bring that with them to ensure that the hospital staff knows what it is or even um, help us to identify this. So then we're asking, what was the substance ingested? Did, was it injected, ingested, absorbed, inhaled? You know, there's a number of routes that we're going to talk about moving forward that these people can take these um, substances. And, you know, some people don't even realize they've been exposed because absorption occurs through our skin. So time tends to work against us. And so the biggest thing is acute onset often indicates a more serious scenario for these individuals. Sorry, trying to make sure. So like we talked about before, how was this taken? Was it injected, absorbed, or inhaled? There's almost a 
always a correlation between the dose and the effects. We want to observe the drug label and consider how the medication, um, whether the medication's absent or whether it's there, what else was taken. This is useful for the ED staff when deciding which test to order. Has the patient vomited or aspirated? How soon after the ingestion or exposure? How much? Um, you also want to inspect the vomitus. This sounds crazy, but if a patient has vomited right there beside you, it's one of the biggest clues you have on whether or not there's pill fragrance still present within the vial itself or whether or not the material is still present. That means they've more than likely not ingested as much as we think, and so it could be a good indicator for the patient. If the patient has vomited into a clear emesis bag, which not all clear emesis bags are clear, um, consider taking this with you to the um, ER. While they're going to not love you for the gift, it's still uh, a good idea to have there with you. And then, of course, what was the substance taken? So then we want to talk about after our primary assessments are made, obviously the things that we're going to be worried about are how is this patient's condition going to change? Um, secondary assessments and continued reassessments are always what they harp on, especially out in the field. We've got little resources in the field to us, and so the primary thing is stabilization and then monitoring whether or not this patient is continuing to be stable or whether new interventions need to be implemented. You know, monitor the patient's condition and reprioritize the status if necessary. So if my patient's completely stable whenever I walk through the door initially and they're talking with me, but they're becoming more and more lethargic and I notice that they're once again not answering questions or becoming to the point that they're so lethargic that I'm not getting any sort of answers, do we need to, you know, initiate other interventions such as protecting their airway for them. Um, we want to continue to check the interventions we do implement. You know, if we're obtaining IV access, um, have we drawn blood before we've given any sort of IV fluids or anything? Have we um, monitored what we're giving the patient, whether or not if we're giving, you know, an acute alcohol intoxication, some um, benzodiazepines to help with anxiousness or if we're giving alcohol withdrawal benzodiazepines to help with delirium tremens, is the benzodiazepine causing us an adverse reaction or is it giving us the appropriate reaction to what we thought, thought it would? Um, the complete appropriate secondary assessment, we want to complete the appropriate secondary assessment for every patient and patients may have alterations in their mental status and may be prone to nausea and vomiting, especially in um, when they've ingested these caustic materials. You know, a lot of these materials are going to be caustic to the stomach. They could have a lot of nausea and vomiting, and that could be the biggest concern. So obviously we're talking about emergency medical care and what things to think about. Obviously ensure your scene safety like we talked about before. Maintaining the airway is going to be the biggest thing for a lot of these individuals. Ensure adequate breathing ensure adequate circulation, are their blood pressures normal, are they hypotensive, hypertensive, you know, what are our characteristics of our patient, and then establishing that vascular access like I talked about. A lot of times you guys are able to get the first IV for these individuals and you guys are placing more IVs than um, some of the ED staff because you get it done before you even get into the hospital. So at the time of placing these IVs, obtaining blood draws and getting a full rainbow and a lot of these individuals is going to be a huge, huge step for the ED staff to be able to um, keep these um, blood draws in track and be able to monitor some of the levels. You know, acetaminophen levels can be taken off of uh, most normal blood draws. It doesn't require a specific um, blood draw, but the thing about it is it's got to be a good blood draw. It's not hemolyzed, it's been um, obtained well, you know, you get it into the bottle and you get it basically mixed with the um, reagents within the actual test tubes to help prevent hemolysis. And then on top of that, the other medical care we talk about, especially in the field, is are we preparing to manage any sort of shock, coma, seizures, or dysrhythmias that are occurring for these patients? 
ingestions for a lot of these individuals can cause shock, hypotension, you know, worsening symptoms. Uh, they can lead up to coma. They can cause seizures. We see seizures most often in those alcohol withdrawal patients. And then, of course, dysrhythmias are the other thing to think about in some of these materials that we'll talk about later. And then are we considering certain antidotes? One of the biggest ones, especially on the truck, um, is Narcan. <laughs> so routes of ingestion, things to think about when we're, one, assessing the patient and taking a look at them. You know, did they take it oral, IV, sublingual, rectal, inhalation, absorption? Well, all of these are very, very much common, you know, we don't realize in a lot of individuals how they're getting these substances. Absorption, obviously that's what we're talking about when we're talking about exposure to um, those organic phosphate type substance like insecticides or uh, pesticides. Our skin and our integumentary system, which is the whole skin, is a very much vascular and porous um, organ system. Anything applied to it, we tend to absorb and the skin will react to. Um, so we have to be really cautious of uh, absorption being an issue for these individuals. Another thing to watch out for, especially in those types of exposures, when we're talking about toxicology specifically, is if they themselves have been exposed through their skin, is their clothing saturated with the material? Are we worried about them being near a pool of the material? Are we worried about you guys, the medical staff, being exposed to the material? All of those things should be things to think about, um, just to know. A lot of times in those biohazard type situations and those types of exposures, sometimes the we've gotten the information from an, another emergency personnel and the dispatcher had been able to provide that. But if you are smelling odd smells or you know, you are noticing odd smells, the concern is, is how is this going to affect you guys? Are you going to be exposed to it for inhalation or even through absorption because it gets on your clothes? Um, we always want to start looking for those clues like I was talking about before early on. Do they have stained fingers that are indicative of some sort of substance use? You know, tobacco users, obviously tobacco is not going to cause us a huge overdose, but tobacco users are going to have that stained brown finger or yellowish discoloration, discoloration to their fingernails. Um, same goes for a lot of these individuals that use meth or cocaine. Their fingernails tend to be longer because they use their fingernail as a source for them to be able to snuff the uh, material. Um, are their fingers dirty because when they're burning the methamphetamine or the heroin in uh, their spoons or trying to um, basically liquefy it so that they can draw it up in an IV solution, a lot of them will have burns on their fingers um, or they may even have um, puncture sites that while they can be on the arms, may also be between the webs of their fingers or even between their um, toes. Do they have substance stains on their lips or tongue? Are they having other types of symptoms like the stomach cramps, nausea and vomiting, or even GI type symptoms? And then of course the pill bottles like we talked about before. We wanna know dates and quantity and I can't continue to harp on that anymore. Um, that's going to be a huge deal, especially for prescription medications. So one of the hardest things about toxicology specifically is how do we create easy ways to remember all of this information for multiple substances that have many different s symptoms? I mean, when we start to think about the number of um, medications and the number of substances we have, it's really hard to try and keep in order what we're going. And so when we talk about creating any easy ways to remember it, we talk about what we call toxidromes, like I was talking about before in the introduction. Toxidro toxidromes are syndrome-like symptoms of a class or group of similar poisonous agents. Um, this makes it useful for remembering the assessment and management of different substances and also makes it uh, useful to remember you know the symptom profiles that you're going to be exposed to for a lot of these substances so 
because this was such a short um, short lecture today, I really tried to group these into major toxidromes. And then later on in the lecture, I went on to kind of discuss um, particular ones that are really more common to us, um, especially here in uh, Southwest Missouri and uh, the four state area. So how we're gonna kind of break this down and how I've broken down the slides is we've got the toxidrome and, that we're talking about and then we're gonna talk about the mental status to changes you tend to expect, the vital site changes, and then the pupillary changes. The pupils are one of the easiest ways to start to identify whether or not an individual has taken an abnormal substance. Meiosis and medriasis are the two words to describe pupillary dilatation and pupillary constriction. So meiosis means pinpoint pupil. Medriasis means uh, means enlarged pupil or um, uh, big pupil. So big word, big pupil for medriasis, little word, little pupil for meiosis. So I gave you examples of both um, pupillary dilatation, especially in medriasis, they're going to have these huge black pupils with very, very little of the iris showing or the color portion of the eye. Meiosis is going to be the pinpoint pupil uh, there that you see on the right. So the first of our biggest toxidromes is the sympatho sympathomimetics. So these particular substances or um, medications produce physiologic effects characteristic of the sympathetic nervous system promoting the stimulation of sympathetic nerves. So when we think about sympathetic nervous system, we think about our flight or fight system. Um, we experience diaphoresis, um, tremors, hyperreflexia, and seizures. Um, examples of these type of medications or substances include cocaine, amphetamines, cata uh, cathinone, sorry, you're going to have to excuse my English, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, phenyl, propanolamine, uh, theophylline, and caffeine. So sympathomimetics, generally the mental status um, changes we see in these particulars, as you can imagine, we're talking about flight or flight type systems that are affected. So they're hyper alert, super agitated, they're having hallucinations, they're super paranoid. They're the ones that are trying to literally jump up off the clot, cot to prevent you from doing anything. Um, a lot of these individuals are gonna be hyperthermic, meaning their temperature is gonna be significantly elevated. They're going to um, be tachycardic, hypertensive, because they're basically their heart is going 90 to nothing and then their vessels are all clamped down because they are getting the blood to where it needs to go and their main main concern is the heart they have a widened pulse pressure tachypnea and then hypipnea which is an elevated heart rate and then the madriasis is what we're going to see or the dilated pupil the next big topic is going to be our anticholinergics. These are going to include the antihistamine, the tricyclic antidepressant, cyclobenzaprine, which is like our flexoral, orphanidrine, anti-Parkinson medications, antispasmodics, phenothiazines, atropine, scopolamine, uh, which a lot of people will use scopolamine, especially for motion sickness, uh, and then the belladonna alkaloids, which are like gems and weed. Generally, anticholinergics, the symptoms that are common for anticholinergic poisoning um, is going to be dry flush skin, dry mucous membrane, decreased bowel movements, urinary retention, myoclonus. Um, they're going to have like a picking behavior and seizures. Um, one of the biggest things, especially that we learned in uh, medical school, uh, was the term uh, hot as a hair, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, 
red is a beat and matte is a hatter. So I'll kind of go over that uh, with you in just a little while. But in anticholinergics, um, again, the mental status changes that we're going to see are they're hypervigilant. Again, you do see some agitation and hallucination, especially antihistamine overdoses, which can occur in elderly populations that have been given multiple antihistamines. Uh, delirium with mumbling speech, their speech is definitely going to be uh, confused and then can even lead up all the way until coma. Vital same changes, again, the hyperthermia, tachycardia, hypertension, and tachypnea, and then medriasis. So when we talk about hot as a hair, there's our, hot, our hyperthermia. They are super warm. Um, then they're dry as a bone, so they aren't going to pee. They aren't going to um, see, and they aren't going to climb a tree. Um, dry as a bone, obviously going back to uh, their mucous membranes are super, super sparse. Um, parse, uh, they are dry. They can't make very much moisture. When we talk about being blind as the bat, um, when you talk about the medriasis, when we think about it in terms of how our body works in general, our eyes dilate to allow more light in, in the setting that we are um, in a dark space. So we walk into a dark room before we flip the light on, our eyes dilate to allow more light in for us to be able to see better. When our eyes are dilated inappropriately, they're allowing so much light in that you really are not able to see as much. Um, then talking about red as a beat, their skin is going to look red in appearance and then matte as a hatter goes to more of the delirium type symptoms. So the next big toxidrome is the hallucinogenics. Um, these are going to be, especially for those individuals back in the 60s that loved their LSD, their PCP. Um, physocybin is a material um, produced by mushrooms, uh, mescaline, and then there's these new designer amphetamines, which are actually hallucinogenic including ecstasy and the MDMA and the MDEA. In hallucinogenics, of course, you're going to see hallucination. They're going to have perceptual distortions. They're going to be very odd in appearance to you, and they're going to think you're odd in appearance. They have uh, symptoms of depersonalization, so they think that their world is this completely different abnormal world. They don't realize who they are. Um, they may experience synesthesia. So when we talk about synesthesia, um, besides being experienced in hallucinogens, individuals can be born with this disorder where when they see a number, they associate a color with it. And that's what you see there in the, um, in the actual picture there. Um, individuals as they read actually experience the letter A as a color or the letter B as a color, you know, that's what synesthesia is. They have this abnormal perception of basic reality and um, a lot of that is due to the hallucinogen, but individuals can actually be born with the uh, issue. Some individuals can um, see colors in association with sound. And then a lot of these individuals can be significantly agitated because of the hallucinations they're having. Vital sign <laughs> changes in these individuals. Um, we tend to talk about the hyperthermia, the tachycardia, hypertension, and then the tachypnea again. A lot of these individuals, because of the agitation and the hallucinations, will get themselves worked up. So then again, Usually we'll see the dilated pupil in these individuals. We may actually see some nystagmus or some shifting of the pupil response. Uh, another big toxidrome is opioids or narcotics. So they get their own class, especially because of the amount of opioids we have. Obviously, the U.S. has been undergoing an opioid crisis for some time due to overprescription habits of providers in the past and um, the inappropriate use of opioids for pain control for chronic pain and other individuals. When we talk about opioids, we're not just talking about, um, you know, hydrocodone or oxycodone. 
We're also talking about heroin, morphine, methadone is a big one. Uh, Suboxone is another one that may come up. Um, Hydromorphone and then diphenoxylate. So with opioid medications, um, mental status changes that are very, very common for these individuals are going to be CNS depression and coma. They are going to be the bradyapnea, which means the lower respiratory rate. They can have apneic episodes, hypothermia, bradycardia, even hypotension because they become so relaxed and it depresses their central nervous system so much. They are going to have meiosis, which are the pinpoint pupils. Um, and then the next big class is going to be the sedative hypnotics. So we see a lot of sedative hypnotics sedative hypnotics now and used to prior to changes within the um, providers prescribing methods, um, especially in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, nowadays, we're seeing where the trend has become either an individual will be on an opioid medication versus a benzodiazepine. However, there are still some providers who prescribe both together, and this can be um, a huge no-no, not only for the prescriber themselves, but also for the individual themselves. Um, what we've been dictated to as providers is if I have a patient on chronic opioid medications, they either get to stay on those medications and be taken off their benzos, or they stay on their benzos and get taken off their opioids. However, nowadays we still have individuals that are getting prescription medications from multiple providers so they're on benzos and opioids so benzos have now created along with some of the other medications their own sedative hypnotic toxidrome um, benzodiazepines being our ativan um, our uh, xanax our uh, barbiturates um, then even alcohol and then ambien are going to be um, huge sedative hypnotic um, things that we tend to talk about with sedative hypnotics, um, they again are going to cause the CNS depression. So one of the mainstays of why prescribers began to have to change their prescribing methods was because both sedative hypnotics and opioid medications caused so much CNS depression that we were seeing so many adverse events that it was decided if you were on one, you had to be taken off the other. Um, besides the CNS depression, individuals experience confusion a lot of times on especially benzodiazepines in elderly individuals. Um, they can have stupor or even develop coma. Uh, vital signs are often normal, but can also be noted to uh, develop hypothermia, bradycardia, hypotension, apnea, and uh, pupillary changes tend to be variable with these particular ones. Um, the next big toxidrome are the cholinergic agents. Um, so cholinergic agents are the organophosphates. They are the pesticides, insecticides, nerve agents, nicotine, pilocarpine, physostigmine, uh, edrophonium, uh, bethanthinicol, and urcholine. Um, so the most common symptoms that we are going to see in these individuals are salivation, urinary and fecal incontinence, diarrhea, emesis, diaphoresis, and lacrimation. So if it has a hole or it secretes something, it's going to secrete it in these individuals. Um, that's kind of the way to determine anticholinergic versus cholinergic toxicity. You know, cholinergic toxicity, these patients can't help themselves as far as their secretions. It's coming out of every hole and it's coming fast. Um, mental status changes you expect to see in cholinergic um, toxicities include confusion, coma, vital state changes, of course, are going to be bradycardia, hypertension, hypotension, and then can be either tachypnea or uh, bradypnea. You know, it can be an either or, so it's a mixed picture, and that's what's one of the hardest things. But one of the things to realize is uh, the salivation or the um, increased mu mucous membrane secretion or the increased GI secretions are what gonna help, help you tell the difference between it and something else. Um, meiosis is definitely what you think about in these. So one of the big 
um, mnemonics we use, especially in um, school for cholinergic crisis. You're going to have SLUD, so salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation. If it's a hole, it's coming out of somewhere. So then another one that especially with the use of antidepressants has become more and more uh, of a more common um, overdose experience or toxidrome is serotonin syndrome. It has been given its own class because of the use of the MAOIs, which are antidepressants, which are monamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, these can be used alone or in conjunction with SSRIs, also mepiridine, dextro metorphan, which can come in cough suppressants, TCAs, and L-tryptophan. So common symptoms in serotonin are going to look similar to um, the anticholinergic toxicity. They're going to have tremors, myoclonus, hyperreflexia, um, but in these particular individuals, um, you're going to say they have diaphoresis and flushing. So when we compare the two, if you looked at the slide, um, you know, I always remember thing, the dirtier the thing was, the easier it was for me to remember, um, especially through medical school. Um, you can see the guy, the, the Mad Hatter, um, similar anticholinergic overdose. Uh, however, serotonin syndrome has the diaphoresis, nausea, and vomiting, where he is dry as a bone, she is hot and wet. So... Uh, that's kind of one of the easiest ways to remember it. She's going to be sweating. She's going to have um, the diaphoresis uh, that we expect. And then, of course, you're also going to see grinding teeth, which is the bruxism, the hyperreflexia, and then some even cogwall uh, rigidity. Um, some of the other symptoms that are common to serotonin syndrome are discussed up there with the confusion, agitation, and lethargy, um, the hyperthermia, and everything else. So like we were talking about, confusion, agitation, can't even lead up to coma, vital sign changes that are common, hyperthermia, tachycardia, hypertension, and tachypnea or elevated uh, respiratory rate. So um, while we've now gone over like the major toxi germs themselves, um, I wanted to spend like a small bit of time kind of going over major substances that we come into contact with, especially within our patient population um, here and around our area. So, of course, alcohol is still going to be a part of toxicology because you have acute intoxications and then also alcohol withdrawal to deal with, with a lot of people. So it's the most widely abused drug slash substance in the U.S. Patients chronically are long-term abusers. Most of the time they experience previous DTs or withdrawal symptoms. Withdrawal generally occurs within 12 to 48 hours, and then delirium tremens usually start within 48 to 82 hours of their last drink. Um, steps and treatments. So one of the biggest things that I always want to reinforce, especially in chronic alcoholics, the guys that you know, you're know you picking up from um, the side of the street or from home that literally all they've done that entire day is drink, they are going to be very much thiamine deficient. Um, thiamine is not something I do believe we have on the trucks a lot of times. I don't know how much availability it is, and so um, Jeff or someone can correct me on that, um, whether or not it's available. But if it is, it is one thing that I think you guys should definitely be giving, especially in your alcoholic patients early on. Um, because these individuals are thiamine deficient, when we give them fluids with glucose, we actually risk the um, chance of causing Warnicke's Korsakoff syndrome um, in these individuals. It's a syndrome or a uh, syndrome of thymine deficiency where they can actually become super delirious. Um, they can have um, a lot of instabilities and actually get basically really, really sick and have an altered mental status if they're given too much glucose because they've been so glucose efficient. And the reasoning behind that is because they're doing nothing but drinking, so they're not taking any sort of food. So thiamine should be a consideration. You guys definitely have Ativan on the truck readily available. It's going to help, especially in um, those um, 
withdrawal type symptoms, benzodiazepines are um, the mainstay for alcohol withdrawal within the deal. Um, while it sounds like small doses, one to two milligrams can help out just a little bit um, early on, especially with ebbing some of the symptoms. Jeff was just texting me and telling me, you know, obviously you guys don't have thymine. So one thing to consider is before we pump them with a lot of IV fluids, while that's going to help them um, at the ER get them rehydrated, um, the concern is administering glucose in fluids is the biggest thing, especially in those alcohol um, deals. So I would definitely talk with Dr. Morgan, your medical director, on you know his opinion of how he wants to uh, prescribe those fluids. You know, a lot of times the mainstay of those acutely intoxicated individuals um, is using the benzodiazepines to ward off any withdrawal symptoms if they haven't had a drink for those 12 to 48 hours. Another big thing, of course, in these individuals obtaining blood draw for glucose level and also for um, uh, alcohol levels and everything else um, for pre-hospitalization labs. DTs, like we talked about before, don't occur usually until that 48 to 82 hour mark that you see there in the middle. Um, DTs usually include the confusion, tremors, restlessness, fevers, seizures, diaphoresis, tachycardia, hypotension, um, and a number of different symptoms. Um, they are the biggest thing we want to watch out for in alcohol withdrawal, and they are going to be helped by the benzodiazepines um, for the individual. Next biggest thing, of course, are going to be the stimulant medications. The big ones are found here, cocaine, methamphetamines, and amphetamines. So in stimulant medications and presentations, they're going to have that agitation, anxiousness, delirium, dilated pupils, because they are on overdrive. Uh, they're going to have difficulty sitting still, hypermetabolic states, profuse sweating. They're going to be thin in appearance because all they want to do is their cocaine or their meth, and a lot of times they've done it for long periods of time, and they don't have to they don't want to eat or drink with it. They just want their high. They're going to have the track marks that we discussed earlier. Um, cocaine itself, the pathophysiology, it's a local anesthetic and nervous system stimulant. It enhances the release and activity of neurotransmitters. Um, crack cocaine is generally cocaine that's mixed with baking soda or water that is cooked or baked in order to um, provide the individual with more substance um, to be used over a longer period of time. Uh, effects of cocaine generally to occur within one to three minutes whenever they're snorted. Um, your nose is a mucous membrane and so it's highly permeable and so that's why a lot of these individuals tend to smoke or snort cocaine. Uh, whenever it's smoked it takes eight to ten seconds again because of mucous membrane and also because of inhalation. Um, when the effects wear off the users experience the crass sensation where they literally are unable to do hardly anything at all and all they're thinking about is their next hit. So in assessment, the biggest thing is going to uh, be to watch out for cardiac abnormalities. Um, especially in cocaine use, um, we're seeing a lot of acute coronary syndromes occur. Um, they develop MIs quickly because of the sympathetic nervous system being on overdrive with the cocaine. Uh, they'll have the chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis. So we want to keep these individuals on um, a continuous ECG and keep a close eye on them. You may also see the ventricular arrhythmias um, and the sudden cardiac death. The next thing, especially that is becoming more and more common, are amphetamines and the prescription drugs themselves for ADHD and ADD are becoming uh, very much uh, problem children for uh, those younger age individuals that are high school to even college age that use and overuse or abuse these medications. So amphetamines can be found in the ADD and ADHD medications and also in diet pills and nasal decongestants. Uh, they can still have overdose from these substances, and so it should be treated and treated similar to methamphetamine overdose. 
you have to monitor these individuals for um, cardiac abnormalities. Um, amphetamines also, of course, include the methamphetamine, crank or ice, MDA, um, or MDMA, or ecstasy. <clears throat> so methamphetamine, it is one of the biggest things, especially here in southwest Missouri. Um, and near our area, it's low cost, long acting, and the ingredients are always available locally. Federal reg regulations are currently trying to address this issue on, uh, of course, things like pseudoephedrine and ephedrine being available within our stores. Meth labs should be treated as hazardous material incidents, um, especially when you guys are arriving on scene. Um, you have no idea what substances are, you know, in around in or around the area or you know within the air itself so always take caution entering these scenes clinical presentation oh, sorry guys clinical presentation is almost identical to that of a person abusing cocaine the difference is these drugs tend to last longer than cocaine itself uh, patient management is the same as for cocaine overdose it's pre-hospital management with supportive care IV fluids, IV access, continuous EEG monitoring, and monitoring their airway. Um, patients can become increasingly paranoid and even psychotic on these stimulant medications. So obviously um, watching out for the need for restraints versus other um, interventions. Bath salts is a new thing. Um, it, on the east and west coast, it was definitely more of a more common thing, but it's becoming something around here. Um, this is obviously a substance related to a chemical compound derived from the cot plant. Um, it's engineered for its high potency. It can be ingested, insufflated, smoked, or uh, injected. They experience severe hallucinations, paranoia, and these people are incredibly strong. They're like, a damn rhinoceros trying to get them down on the floor or to do anything and they developed the excited delirium um, of course management of stimulant abuse like we've been talking about through this entire thing establish and maintain an airway give supplemental oxygen as needed uh, vascular access EKG monitoring fluid administration aggressive cooling for fat hyperthermia um, administering benzodiazepines as appropriate for agitation and for violent behavior. This may warrant application of restraints versus sedation. Uh, another big thing, while we don't think of this on the toxicology side as much because it's becoming such a new common thing um, with medical marijuana becoming a thing, marijuana and THC can still be toxic for many individuals. So the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana or cannabis is the THC, the Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabal. Uh, this is usually smoked or ingested. You know, they have THC gummies, they have everything you can think of uh, for THC nowadays. Short-term effects for some individuals tend to be tachycardia, balance and coordination issues, increased appetite. Of course, everybody's got the munchies. Cyclic vomiting syndrome, however, is one of the big um, syndromes that occurs in excessive use, individuals that tend to um, smoke marijuana or pot daily uh, can present with the cyclic vomiting syndrome. They get very little um, help from uh, Phenagrin or Zofran or any of the normal antiemetics. Um, one of the new things that's come out is um, uh, even smelling alcohol swabs um, that you have on the truck can help with some nausea. However, in cyclic vomiting syndrome, literally just about um, nothing works. Uh, another big thing is I think it's capsaicin cream they're using um, that you can rub on the stomach to help out. I'd have to look that up, so don't quote me on that one, but there is a cream you can rub on the stomach to help with um, nausea as well in these individuals. Management, of course, is going to be supportive therapy. Usually the effects are not life-threatening, however, reactions occur um, whenever it's laced with something else. Benzodiazepines can be considered for anxiousness and those that feel anxious. So of course, we've got to talk about LSD too. Um, this was more widely uh, common, especially in the 60s uh, to 70s range. It's a hallucinogen like we talked about before. It's derived from fungus 
It affects all of the senses, whether that be sight, smell, uh, taste, everything. Um, these individuals can develop tachyarrhythmias, palpitations, the um, uh, uh, pupillary dilation or the medriasis that we were talking about before, and uh, management is primarily supportive. A big overdose or toxic agent, especially now, um, because of the prescribing methods I talked about before, are benzodiazepines for a lot of people. They are the member of the sedative hypnotic nerve, the big family member of the sedative hypnotics. They stimulate the gamma aminobutyric acid pathways to cause sedation and anxiolytic effects. Common clinical effects generally tend to be altered mental status, drowsiness, slurred speech, incoordination, um, and significant confusion. Uh, management tends to be airway management, vascular access, and EKG monitoring with IV fluids. Um, one of the biggest antidotes that we hear about in benzodiazepine is uh, flumazenil. Flumazenil is definitely available at the hospital. It is not something that we actually use as commonly as most people think. While it is an antidote that is available, a lot of times in chronic benzodiazepine users, when you give flumazenil, the caution becomes um, that negative side effects, including significant seizures, can occur with the administration of the medication. So you have to be very cautious uh, giving the medication itself. <clears throat> Opioids and narcotics, another of the biggest things, especially in intentional overdoses these days, uh, as discussed previously, uh, it's a continued uh, opioid use epidemic within our nation right now, um, and that's given previous overprescribing methods. This binds the receptors in the brain um, and the tissue to help cause the analgesia, but it can also cause the euphoric type symptoms, and you can develop hypotension, respiratory depression, or the pinpoint pupils. <clears throat> Biggest thing. Um, with opioid and narcotic management, establish an airway, obtain vascular access, and then administer Narcan. Um, Narcan doses are going to be appropriate for these patients that you see an initial response to being given Narcan. They, their symptoms start to improve, they start to become more alert, start to note um, improvement um, in symptoms. So if they start to worsen, you can always redose them with Narcan. Um, especially in the hospital where it's more available, we will start Narcan drips on a lot of individuals that have ingested quite a lot of opioids, um, and it helps with improvement in their symptoms quite rapidly. Another big overdose topic, especially nowadays, are antidepressants. One of the big topics, though, that I wanted to bring up was the tricyclic antidepressants today. Um, while the SSRIs and stuff like that can cause the serotonin syndrome, tricyclic antidepressants are big and um, becoming more and more widely used, not just for depression itself, but also for in insomnia for individuals that have sleeping disorders or eating disorders, and even in those individuals' personality disorders. The big two names that I definitely want you guys to watch out for are amitriptyline and nortriptyline. They're some of the most wild or, or widely used now. Um, biggest concerns are tachyarrhythmias. These medications tend to cause prolonged PR interval, widened QRS, and the prolonged QT intervals. So they can develop um, arrhythmias very much with even a small amount of overdose or a small amount administered. Uh, watch out. Watching these patients on continuous EEG is going to be the mainstay of uh, pre-hospital care. Uh, they can also be tachypneic, hypotensive, hyperthermic. They can have that anti-muscarinic qualities, um, which are anticholinergic toxidrome um, may present as. So they're going to be sim similar to the anticholinergic. The uh, biggest thing is maintaining the airway vascular access, provide the continuous EEG monitoring, and IV fluids for hypotension. You can consider sodium bicarb uh, therapy, which helps to protect against the arrhythmias, um, but it's something to definitely use with caution. And then, of course, one of the biggest over-the-counter medications that we tend to talk about in overdose, especially in um, younger kids and even teenage years, is acetaminophen. 
Uh, Tylenol is one of the number one things we see a lot of times in overdose. It's something that I've managed a couple of times, even with being a new hospitalist here in Freeman. Um, signs and symptoms occur usually in the four distinct stages, and you can see the stage plus the days. Um, in the first day, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, sweating, general discomfort. They can have some liver function abnormalities early on. Then they'll develop the liver injury. Um, that's when we see a huge elevation in their ALT or ASD, which are their liver function tests, and you can even see a rise in their INR. Then uh, days three and five, have had a toxicity generally tends to peak, and that's when you're going to know whether or not you have the response. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, stage four is the recovery stage. So accidental versus intentional children, generally 200 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, per day is going to be their toxic dose. Um, adults is going to be greater than three grams. So if we're thinking about this, usually extra strength Tylenol comes in the 500 milligram tablets. So two tablets, three times a day, and they're already at their three grams. Um, most individuals can go a little bit over that. Obviously, we don't want them going over three grams, but it's something to watch out for. Um, another thing to watch out for too, and to be concerned about in um, these individuals, is they tell you, you know, I haven't been feeling well, I've been taking Tylenol, plus my hydrocodone, which has Tylenol in it. Um, the 325 milligram portion of the hydrocodone tablet is Tylenol. So that has to be added to the amount of Tylenol they're taking daily um, to get the amount that they're taking to watch out for uh, toxicity. Management, of course, is going to be supportive care on the way to the hospital. Um, being able to tell, however, if it is an intentional overdose of Tylenol early on may help the facility to um, prep for the patient getting there. N-acetylcysteine is the big antidote for Tylenol use. We, of course, have to have a Tylenol level first, so early access with uh, blood draws is going to be a, a huge thing prior to arriving. They will likely still redraw it, but if we know a time of when you drew yours, we can compare levels to depending on how um, how long of a transfer it is to the facility. Um, another thing to be concerned about is if we are really concerned about the possibility for a um, hepatotoxicity to specifically liver failure, while a lot of times we address this once they get to the ER, um, our biggest concern is these patients may end up needing transfer to a tertiary care facility um, because both Freeman and Mercy do do any sort of liver transplant, and they, even though they had an intentional overdose, may still be a candidate, and so they may require ED to ED transfer later, and so it's another thing to uh, know about because you may have to run an acetylcysteine in the truck when you guys are uh, transferring these patients. So uh, that is the end of my long, drawn-out talk. I'm sorry for keeping you guys so long. Um, I tried to keep it as close to an hour as I could, and I apologize, but I thank you for sticking with me. Um, do you guys have any big questions or anything right now? Jacob, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Uh, we're checking the chat board for questions, and uh, maybe just hang out for a moment, and if there are any, I'll just relay them to you. Okay. That sounds good. Thanks for your presentation. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, the live stream's about 30 seconds behind, so it takes them a little bit to even realize you're done. So. Okay. Uh, we're oh, actually, we're only about 15 seconds behind at the moment. That's good. Yeah. Thank yous and thumbs up, but nobody's got questions for you at the moment. So. All right, cool. I think we had 30, probably close to 40 people actually watching live. So. Well, I apologize for it being a cut down version, but no, no, you're fine. there are a lot of things to go over. Yeah, there's a lot. It tied in well with what we already did this morning, so it was great. Good. Thank you for thumbs up, but nobody's got questions for you guys. Okay, we're good. All right, Jake. I think we're All done. All right, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate thank it. Thank you.
Take care. You guys have a good day. You too.